<laughs> Hi there, my name is Jeff Weber, and I'm an Arctic climatologist at the Unidata Program Center in Boulder, Colorado at UCAR NCAR. And this is Max Weber, he's my assistant. Hello. He's a wizard in training, and he'll be doing uh, some of the work with us today. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be representing extreme cloud formation. Now, as you saw in the last module, hot air rises, and as that hot air rises into the atmosphere, it makes a cloud. And what we're going to do here is we're going to amplify that effect by using dry ice. Now, we call it dry ice because if you were to take this ice and set it outside like this, after it melts, there would be nothing left. We call that sublimation. It goes from a solid to a gas. And then like water ice, which is frozen water, this is frozen carbon dioxide. And so carbon dioxide is present in our atmosphere, and it's a lot colder when we chill this one down. Frozen carbon dioxide is minus 110 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas, you know, water ice is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And so normally what happens here on the Great Plains in Tornado Alley, you'll have the very warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico coming up into the high plains, and that interacts with the cold air from the Rocky Mountains. Now, warm and cold air don't like each other very much, as you might have seen with Mike Nelson's tornado dance. And so that creates instability. And the difference between the warm and the cold, the greater that difference is, the more unstable the atmosphere becomes. And so generally speaking, when we have tornadoes, we're talking about 90, 95 degree temperature coming out of the Gulf of Mexico, interacting with maybe minus 40 degree temperatures from the atmosphere aloft coming out of the Colorado Rocky Mountains. What we've done here today is we've got a cauldron of boiling water at 212 degrees and our dry ice, which is minus 110 Fahrenheit. So it's about 300 degrees difference in temperature between the dry ice and the boiling water. Whereas here in our environment in the United States with the 90 degree Gulf of Mexico air and minus 40 with the temperature of the air aloft, it's about 130 degrees difference. So we should see a much more dramatic effect here for these cloud formation as we pour this dry ice into the pot of boiling water. Now you have to be careful with this because dry ice is very cold. If you're not wearing gloves, it could freeze or burn your hands. So please, you can do some of these activities at home. You can do dry ice activities at home and you can actually buy dry ice at many of your local groceries. Um, people use it when they go on camping because it's dry ice. So when you put the dry ice in your cooler, it doesn't melt and make all of your food wet and soggy. So it's a very popular item for campers to use in their coolers. Now, I know there's a lot of family and friends out there watching today. I'd like to say a big hello to Crosby and Lorelei and Emily and Phil out there in Denver and all the other friends and family. Now, we've had some small clouds forming here. We've got some dry ice and some warm water and it's kind of puffing up some, what we call like small little clouds. These are the things that you might see on a day-to-day -day basis kind of like here in Boulder, Colorado that we're having today. We've got some nice dry ice going here, making some other small clouds as well. But as wizards, we kind of like to make things go big. And so what I think we're gonna do now is that with my assistant is we're going to take this dry ice. There are very large bowls of dry ice and another large bowl of dry ice. And we're going to pour that into this cauldron of boiling water. And it's going to create an incredible cloud. Now, this is exactly the type of situation you would see in a very active thunderstorm that's going to create tornadoes. You'll get this incredible vertical motion up and down inside the thunderstorm. And that's what creates these supercells. That's what creates these tornadoes is this incredible vertical motion interacting with a jet stream aloft. And so if you see some sort of tornadic activity here as this begins, I wouldn't be surprised because oftentimes that's what we get. So... Fasten your seatbelts, and we're going to have some extreme cloud formation with my help from my assistant, Max. All right, now we're wearing gloves. We've got our eye goggles, protective covers on. We've got our wizard hats. Let's make an extreme cloud. All right, everybody, let's count it down. Three, two, one. <laughs> so this is extreme cloud formation. This is like the cloud tops you would see on top of a supercell thunderstorm. Notice how the clouds are rising up and doubling and churning. 
This is exactly what happens inside a big thunderstorm when you're out and about on the high plains. And this roiling air as the wind comes in, this is kind of how tornadoes get started. You get this vertical velocity, and they bend it, and they twist it, and they get the tornadoes going. So that's our extreme cloud formation. Be happy to take any questions about anything weather or anything about clouds. That is so cool. Is this is this something that people could or would be able to try at home? Well, yes, Tiffany. This is you know again dry ice is very cold. It's a minus 110 degrees Fahrenheit, so you have to wear gloves when you're handling it. And the boiling water is also very hot. But if you take proper precautions, have gloves, eye protection cover your whole skin so you don't get freeze or burn or blast with the boiling water, then you can take care of these things at, at home. And as I mentioned earlier, you can get dry ice at many of your local grocers. Awesome. We don't have any questions coming in quite yet from the audience, but I have one because you know I always have questions. <laughs> Tell me about- Sure, you know let's have a question. We're talking about these extreme storms like tornadoes and, and thunderstorms. And I'm betting that pretty much everybody is familiar with hearing at times of a tornado or a severe storm watch or a warning. How do we know the difference between a watch and a warning? Yeah, that's a really good question. Now, when we have a tornado watch, that indicates, that's why we wear our protection for that big blow up right there. Um, when we have a tornado watch, that means the conditions are right for tornadoes. And when I say conditions are right for tornadoes, those are the, the elements that we just discussed today. Having that very warm, moist air at the surface and very cold air aloft, creating that instability. And so those are the elements that we know need to be included, the ingredients that we need for a tornado. So that's when we put out a tornado watch. A tornado warning is when we know we have a tornado actively on the ground. And so when you have a tornado warning, definitely time to seek shelter. That means we have an active tornado in your area, whereas a tornado watch just means the atmospheric conditions are ready for tornado development. Okay, that's good for everybody to know, I think. And um, there was another question, actually, if anybody was on the last one, there was a question about ice cloud formation. And Tim actually said sure. that potentially you could expand on that. Sure. I'll explain on ice cloud formation and also about cloud formation in general. First off, all cloud types except for one need vertical motion to make the cloud. You have to rise that warm moist air up to where it becomes liquid water. We call it the lifted condensation level because the vapor is turning into water, creating the clouds. And so all clouds need that vertical motion to create the cloud type. However, there's one type of cloud that forms in descending air and those are the mammatus clouds. And that's when the cold air aloft is no longer being held up there by the vertical motion of the thunderstorm, and that cold air starts to fall down. And as that cold air falling down interacts with the warm air, it creates these um, mammatus clouds. They kind of look like falling pillows. It's an incredible sky. We see them here in Colorado uh, very often after thunderstorms. It, they're indicative of the fact that the thunderstorm has come to a close. Now, as we go into ice clouds, as I was saying, when we lift the, the water vapor up to where it condenses, and so when we lift that water up and it condenses and becomes water, if, if, if we lift it up there and it's so cold that it becomes ice crystals, then we have an ice cloud. Now, sometimes the air is so cold at the surface that we even have ice crystals or an ice fog here on the surface. So what's really important about whether you're going to have a rain cloud or an ice cloud is the temperature of that environment. And if the temperature of that environment is below freezing, the water will... will form as ice, you'll have an ice cloud, and those need to be aloft up in the sky. We can even have ice fog, which is down here on the ground. And that, that's one of my favorite types of days here in Colorado is when we have ice fogs. It's a, it's a fantastic uh, experience to be walking around in ice fog. I really love it. Yeah, that just sounds cool. <laughs> so we have, I, I'm going to actually combine a couple questions here for you, Jeff, because Leaf is wondering generally um, a little bit more about the experiment that you just showed us. What are clouds made of and how does dry ice and hot water form clouds? And then you okay. might even follow with Lydia, who's four years old and joining us today, is wondering how do clouds turn into rain? Kind of that whole process. Hi, Lydia. And thank you all for the questions. 
Um, well, how do clouds form rain? This is, this is a really fun question. Clouds are made up of water. And they're just floating up there. And they're, they're, they're keeping the water up in the sky because there's that rising warm air. Now, once those water droplets get big enough that that rising warm air can't keep them up in the air anymore, they just fall from the sky. And that's how we get our rain. And so it's really a, a matter of the raindrops getting big enough that they can fall from the sky, but they're no longer being held up by the, the rising warm air. And so that's how we get our rain. And I'm sorry, Tiffany, what was the other question? <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I gave you too many at once. But but <laughs> the other piece of all that was how does the actual the dry ice and the hot water, what's that doing to form clouds? Okay, so we're getting kind of a, a double cloud when we use the dry ice and the hot water. Because when we put the really cold dry ice into the water, it's making the the the, the boiling water condensate around the cold dry ice. But some of that dry ice is releasing carbon dioxide, which is what it's made of as a gas as well. So when we pour the dry ice into the hot water, we're getting water vapor clouds as well as carbon dioxide clouds. Now that's why we did it outside because carbon dioxide, although it's in our atmosphere all the time, it is somewhat poisonous to humans. We exhale, exhale carbon dioxide when we breathe. We breathe in oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide. So our bodies are getting rid of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is also a greenhouse gas and it's formed when you uh, run fossil fuels like either coal plants or cars or even forest fires release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and that carbon dioxide absorbs the radiation from the earth and the sun and re radiates re it's back to the earth and that's what we call it a greenhouse gas so while carbon dioxide is very helpful for plants it's not very beneficial to humans um, and so uh, plants unlike us they breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen whereas we breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide so we have this really nice relationship with the, with the plant world here on this planet where we have this symbiotic relationship we use what they don't and they use what we don't so that's really kind of neat um but so when we're doing this carbon dioxide with the boiling water we're getting two types of clouds we're getting the water cloud and the dry ice cloud a co2 cloud okay that's great to know and in fact um, you kind of just brought up one of the other questions, which was, is, is carbon dioxide, is CO2 safe when it's in our air that we're breathing? Yeah, and, and, and it is safe because it comes out of our bodies all the time. Every time we exhale, we're breathing out carbon dioxide. But there's a reason we're breathing it out. It's because our bodies can't use it. We're using the oxygen. And so, yes, it's relatively safe. But if you were in a room completely filled with carbon dioxide, there'd be no oxygen and you wouldn't be able to breathe. And so that's when it becomes unsafe. And it's also unsafe when we get to the levels so high in our atmosphere that our planet warms. And that's kind of where we're at right now. We're, we're increasing the carbon dioxide in our planetary system, and that's warming the planet. And so while it is safe and it's beneficial to plants, it does have a, a side effect of warming the planet. And obviously the human body does not like carbon dioxide. That's why we exhale and we get rid of it as we breathe. Okay, that makes sense. Great, thank you. This is a cool question from Evan, and I bet a lot of people might be wondering this. Can I make my own mini tornado? Hey, Evan. Uh, yes, we, we all like to make mini tornadoes. If you've ever been up to the NCAR Mesa lab, we have a display where they create a tornado. Now, what would be a fun way to do that, there'd be a couple of ways to do that, but you're gonna have to have some sort of forcing, some sort of fans. And so you can get one fan right underneath an experiment like this to get the rotation, or you get like three or four fans and place them at angles around and get the spinning that way. So you're, you're going to have to have some sort of mechanical force, some sort of forcing to get that spin going. Whereas here on Earth, what we have to get that, that energy is the jet stream aloft and all the winds combining at the surface to give us all that energy. And since we're on a smaller scale, we have to create the energy generally with fans or, or something along those lines. And so that's the way to, to create your own tornado is to create these clouds like this and then get them spinning with some sort of fan action. And you can get some really cool stuff. And up at the Mason Lab, when we do open back up, you can come and visit our displays there and see our inside tornado. Absolutely. I hope that's going to be sooner than later. <laughs> So along those lines, I'm skipping around through some of the questions because they're kind of leading into other ones. And um, Max is asking, how does a tornado get its spin? Which is, you were talking about how we could do it. 
sure. Well, Max, that's, I, I love your name. This is my Max. So great to see you, Max, out there on I the internet. Max too. <laughs> now, Maxes are everywhere. It's raining Maxes. Yay, Max. <laughs> um, here's the thing. We're still studying tornadoes in their formation, and we're not exactly sure how they form because some thunderstorms look exactly the same as other thunderstorms, and yet one will produce a tornado and another one won't. So there's a couple of ways that tornadoes are thought to, to form. The prevailing thought is that as wind speed changes with height, we call that wind shear. And generally speaking, the wind is higher as you get up in the atmosphere than it is along the surface, primarily because of houses and trees causing friction at the surface. So as you get a, a little bit higher above all the, the, the boundary layer obstacles, the wind can be faster. And so since the wind increases with speed as you go up, it kind of creates rotors, rolling wind. Now this wind is horizontal. And so that's not quite a tornado yet, but you get these, these horizontal rollers at, at the beginning of these thunderstorms because of this increasing wind speed with height. And then when you, you'll hear people talk about tornadoes, the tornado forecast, they'll talk about upper level support or upper air support. And what you need is to have the jet stream, ideally, come right over that thunderstorm. And if the jet stream, which is the high winds at about 25 to 30,000 feet in the atmosphere, as that's zipping over that thunderstorm, it creates a low pressure. It's kind of like when you're in a shower with a shower curtain and the shower curtain tries to draw in towards the shower. That's because the stream of water is creating a lower pressure inside the shower than it is outside and that draws the shower curtain in. Think of that in the reverse and having the jet stream aloft going by really high and here's the spinning rotor underneath it. As it gets stretched upward, that horizontal roller gets stretched until it gets to be vertical and that's how we create tornadoes. That's at least the prevailing current thought. Um, there's still a lot to be learned about tornadoes, and that is one of the areas of research at the National Center for Atmospheric Research because we still don't know exactly how and why they form. Really great question, Max. Thanks for asking that one. Maybe some of you who are watching today might end up being scientists studying tornadoes and learning more about them over time. So thanks, Jeff. We have time for just a couple more questions. I just did want to say um, Joe and a lot of people agreed, just said that is a cool cloud in the cauldron. And I agree too. <laughs> They're enjoying that. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. So we'll try to get to a couple of more questions. Um, Wallace is asking, what's your favorite type of cloud? My favorite type of cloud is the lenticular cloud also called a lens cloud. And we get those a lot here on the front range of the Rockies. And the reason I like the lenticular clouds the most is because they're the only clouds that actually have air go through them and they stay in the same place. It's like a standing wave in water. And so the cloud stays the exact same location all day and the air is going through it. So the cloud is constantly changing what it's made out of, but it's staying in the same place and they make for incredibly beautiful sunsets. So uh, lenticular clouds, I think, are probably my favorite. Great question. There's so many clouds. Uh, I love clouds. I love to stay uh, and, and look at all the clouds in the sky and, and name them and, and figure out how they formed. It's a, it's a fascinating study. It is indeed. Um, OK, here's another good question. What's the temperature of a cloud? These are great questions we're getting today. Wow, yeah. And so the temperatures of clouds can, can change dramatically. Uh, for example, you can have noctilucent clouds, which are really high clouds over the Arctic that are like 50 miles off the surface. And they're really cold. They're like, you know, minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Most of the clouds that we see when the, the vapor comes up and condenses, usually the, the cloud bottom height is right around 32 degrees, because that's where our water vapor will be condensing into a liquid. And so um, depending upon the base of the cloud, they can change in temperature. The, the lower base clouds are going to be warmer, and the higher base clouds are going to be hot, uh, colder. And so um, and when they get below 32 degrees, they form into ice clouds. And so there's a lot of different temperatures in clouds. Um, for example, temperatures of clouds in hurricanes will be very, very mild, you know, 70, 80 degrees. Clouds here in Colorado today, uh, the bottom of the clouds might be 40, 50 degrees, and the top of the clouds might be 10 or 15 degrees colder than that. So um, there's a lot of variability on the temperatures of clouds based primarily on how high in the atmosphere they are, what type of season it is, and where on the planet they're located. Great. Okay. Thank you. I, these are, we definitely have some weather fans joining us this afternoon, asking some great questions. And we may not have time to get to them all, but we're going to cruise through a couple of more. 
Karen's wondering how quickly do severe weather clouds form? Karen, that's a really good question. And severe weather clouds can form very quickly. If you have the right ingredients, such as a very warm, moist air mass interacting with a very cold air mass, things can get severe in, 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 the, in a matter of 15 minutes. Um, they can spin up very quickly. If you watch thunderstorms in, in slow motion or on time lapse, you can see that they start off very slow and then they get this rapid blow up to the top. And, and that explosive blowing up from like a 20,000 foot top to like a 45,000 foot top can take place in five or 10 minutes. And so um, things can change very quickly in the atmosphere, especially if you, have the, if you have the right ingredients, which is really warm, moist air and very cold, dry air. That increases the instability and really gets that vertical motion going. And so things can get severe very quickly. I, I've, I've seen radar scans where on one radar scan, there's nothing there. And then five minutes later, another radar scan comes by and it's already gone severe. So uh, things can happen very quickly. Wow, that's incredible. Okay, let's jump into one more because this is another good question. Why are some clouds more gray and others are so bright white? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question because when you look at the clouds, if they look very um, white and very shiny and bright, there's probably not a, whole, a lot of water in there. Now, as they build more or larger water droplets, they block more and more of the sun. So they look darker and darker. And so when you look at the cloud base and it doesn't look very dark, you probably are not going to be expecting much rain. But if you look at the cloud base and it's very dark, that means it's absorbing all the sunlight. And that means there's a lot of water in there and it's about to rain really hard. And if you look at the base of the cloud and you can kind of see a, a greenish hue or tint to it, that's the ice absorbing the, the sunlight and getting a little bit of the green light back out. And that's how you can tell if there's going to be ice or hail in the storm. And so just being on the ground, you don't have to have a radar or a satellite or, or a, a sophisticated model to tell you what the weather is. You can tell a lot of the weather just by looking at the clouds. And if you look at a white puffy cloud, say, well, that's a fair weather cumulus cloud, probably no rain. If you look at a cumulus cloud that's got a very dark base, it's probably still a lot more water, bigger raindrops, and it will probably rain soon. Yeah, I actually grew up in Texas, and when we had tornado weather and the possibility of tornadoes, we used to say that the sky looked green. That was really weird. <laughs> yeah, when the sky is green, it, 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 you're ready for some severe weather. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we only have time for one more question, but since I just brought up tornadoes again, um, Griffin is wondering how big can tornadoes get? Hey, Griffin, fun question. Um, probably the largest tornado in the United States was the El Reno tornado, which was about four years ago. It was three miles wide. So um, that, that's dramatically wide. That's incredibly wide. Most tornadoes are, are not on that scale, but they can get multiple miles in width. And so you're talking about an area uh, 30 blocks wide with tornado force winds. And so um, they can get to be fairly large. Um, three miles is, is a, a, a really big tornado. Most of them are like a quarter of a mile wide, you know, like a thousand feet or 1500 feet wide. But um, the El Reno tornado in Texas, Oklahoma was three miles wide. Wow. That's incredible. Well, Amazing. Jeff, it's been so fun exploring some of this extreme weather and these extreme clouds with you. And if, if people have been in the presentations before us, they might've already seen, but I just wanted to make sure that you know that I'm wearing my cumulus cloud earrings today in honor of all of this talk about weather and learning about weather. <laughs> Yay, cumulus clouds. Well, we want to thank everybody for tuning in today. My assistant Max wants to thank everybody for tuning in and um, science is fun. We love Super Science Saturday. We're looking forward to seeing you all in person, hopefully next year up at the NCAR Mesa Lab as we do this again next year. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff and Max. And if anybody is going to join us again, we're going to make a very quick transition. And we have another show starting at 1.30 or perhaps 1.32. <laughs> Thanks so much. Bye. Bye-bye.